Assessment of the GI system. Glossary. Ascites an abnormal accumulation of serous fluid in the abdominal cavity containing large amounts of protein and electrolytes. Bulge, a protruding part, an outward curve or swelling. Cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver is a chronic disease of the liver characterized by the replacement of normal tissue with fibrous tissue and the loss of functional liver cells. Digestion, the process by which food is converted into substances that can be absorbed and assimilated by the body. Dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing. Osophageal varices, abnormally dilated or swollen vessels in the osophagus, which can lead to bleeding. Food allergy, an abnormally high sensitivity to certain foods. Food intolerance, inability to completely digest a type of food, usually due to an enzyme deficiency. Hernia, the protrusion of an organ or other bodily structure through the wall that normally contains it, a rupture. Mass, an aggregate of cells clumped together, such as a tumor. Referred pain, pain sensation experience in one part of the body that is different to the actual area of pathology. Spider navy, or angioma, a dilation of superficial capillaries with a central red dot from which blood vessels radiate. Visceral pain, pain related to the internal organs. Gastrointestinal assessment. When conducting a focused gastrointestinal assessment on patient, both subjective and objective data are needed. Components may include History taking Chief complaint Present health status Past health history Current lifestyle Psychosocial status Family history Physical assessment Diagnostic evaluation Communication during the history and physical exam must be respectful and performed in a culturally sensitive manner. Privacy is vital, and the healthcare professional needs to be aware of posture, body language, and tone of voice while interviewing the patient. Eye history taking. Chief complaints and present health status. It is important to begin by obtaining a thorough history of abdominal or gastrointestinal complaints. Nurse will need to elicit information about any complaints of gastrointestinal disease or disorders. Gastrointestinal disease usually manifests as the presence of one or more of the following. Change in appetite. Weight gain or loss. Dysphagia. Intolerance to certain foods. Nausea and vomiting. Change in bowel habits. Abdominal pain. Appetite. Ask patients if they have had any changes in appetite or food intake. If they have, ask for more information about the change. Appetite and eating can be influenced by many factors that may indicate gastrointestinal disease or that can be attributed to socioeconomic considerations such as food availability, family norms, peers, and cultural practices. A loss of taste sensation can contribute to loss of appetite and potentially result in poor nutrition especially in older individuals. Attempts at voluntary control can be a factor, such as dieting or eating disorders. Weight loss or gain. Document any change in weight. If weight loss or gain is substantial or has happened rapidly, investigate further. Dieting to a body weight leaner than recommended health standards tends to be highly promoted by current fashion trends, sales campaigns for special foods, and is encouraged in some activities and professions. Young women are especially at risk for diet-related alterations in normal gastrointestinal functions. Weight loss may also be associated with illness, while weight gain may be attributed to fluid retention or a mass. Dysphagia. People with dysphagia have difficulty swallowing and may also experience pain while swallowing. Some people may be completely unable to swallow or may have trouble swallowing liquids, foods, or saliva. Eating becomes a challenge, making it difficult to take in enough calories and fluids to nourish the body. Ask patient if they have any difficulty swallowing and when the difficulty first occurred. Intolerance to food. Ask patient if they have any intolerance to certain foods. If so, ask which foods and the type of reaction to the food. Food intolerance should not be confused with food allergies.
stomach. An intolerance to certain foods is generally based on the presence of a gastrointestinal imbalance such as having too little of a particular enzyme that can hinder proper breakdown and use of the food by the body. Food intolerance may be related to disorders such as celiac disease, insulin-dependent diabetes, and inflammatory bowel disease. Symptoms of intolerance to a particular food might include stomach discomfort, gas, bloating, burping, flatulence, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting can be side effects of medications, a manifestation of many diseases, and can occur frequently in early pregnancy. Ask your patients about the frequency of these symptoms. Nausea vomiting may also indicate food poisoning. Questions about types of food eaten in the past 24 hours should be asked to rule out potential poisoning. If vomiting is present, you will want to ask about the amount, frequency, color, and odor of the vomitus. Ask if there is any blood in the vomit or if the vomit appears to be like coffee grounds. Hemic messes, or blood in the vomitus, is a common symptom of gastric or duodenal ulcers and may also indicate oesophageal varices. Coffee ground emesis indicates an old gastrointestinal bleed. The old, partially digested blood appears to look like coffee grounds. Changes in bowel habits. Particular emphasis should be placed on changes in bowel habits, as it is a common manifestation of gastrointestinal disease. The frequency, color, and consistency of bowel movements should be assessed. Assess the use of laxatives at this time. Black. Tarry stools may indicate an upper gastrointestinal bleed or may simply be from the ingestion of iron supplements or over-the-counter medications for gastrointestinal upset. Bright red blood in the stools may indicate hemorrhoids or localized lower gastrointestinal bleeding. Currant jelly stools are usually foul-smelling and resemble maroon or purple-colored jelly. The presence of currant jelly stools often indicates a massive bleeding episode and the patient's hemodynamic status must be assessed quickly. Abdominal pain. If patient is experiencing abdominal pain, have them point to the exact location of the pain. Abdominal pain can be classified as visceral, parietal, referred, visceral pain. Visceral pain is usually described as dull, crampy, squeezing, or aching. It can be constant or intermittent. The pain may be difficult to localize around may be located over an abdominal organ. Parietal pain. Parietal pain is usually from inflammation over the peritoneum. Peritoneal inflammation usually indicates an underlying emergency and should be assessed quickly. Parietal pain is usually intense, constant, and on one side. It can be aggravated by extension of the lower extremity on the affected side, cuffing, or eliciting rebound tenderness. Referred pain. Referred pain is usually visceral pain that is felt in another area of the body when a common nerve pathway is shared. It occurs with specific gastrointestinal disorders such as appendicitis, can cause umbilical pain in early stages, gallbladder disease, referred to right upper scapula, and pancreatitis, referred to the midback. Mnemonic for pain assessment. In general, the mnemonic, PQRST, is very useful in assessing abdominal pain and other gastrointestinal symptoms, such as distension, nausea, and vomiting. It provides a methodology in which communication to other healthcare providers will be efficient and informative. P is equal to provocative or palliative, what makes the pain or symptom, S, better or worse. Q is equal to quality, describe the pain or symptom, S, burning, dull, and sharp. R is equal to region or radiation, where in the body does the pain or symptom, S, occur. Is there radiation or extension of the pain or symptom, S, to another area of the abdomen? S is equal to severity, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst. How bad is the pain or symptom, S? Another visual pain scale may be appropriate for patients that are unable to identify with this scale. T is equal to timing. Does it occur in association with something else? E.g. eating, exertion, movement. Past health history. Ask about any past history of gastrointestinal disorders such as ulcers, gallbladder disease, hepatitis, 
Appendicitis, hernias. Ask the patient if they received treatment and if the treatment was successful. History should also include past abdominal surgeries, any abdominal problems after the surgery, and abdominal x-rays or tests, including colonoscopy, and their results. Medication history. Many medications can produce gastrointestinal symptoms. Almost every class of drugs has the potential for gastrointestinal side effects. Most of the side effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and or constipation. Aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, may cause abdominal pain and may increase the likelihood of gastrointestinal bleeding. Dietary supplements and the use of over-the-counter medications should also be included. Social history and lifestyle risk factors. In taking a complete history, it is important to address lifestyle risk factors and social behaviors that may contribute to unhealthy lifestyles and increase the risk of gastrointestinal disorders. Ask patients about the frequency and duration of alcohol consumption, caffeine intake, and cigarette smoking at this time. Alcohol can cause liver cirrhosis and esophageal varices. Cigarette smoking and regular ingestion of caffeine can lead to gastric reflux and gastric ulcers. Also ask about recreational drug use such as marijuana, opiates, or amphetamines. The use of illicit drugs can increase or suppress appetite and affect GI function. Nutritional Assessment Assessing nutritional status of patients is important for several reasons. A thorough nutritional assessment will identify individuals at risk for malnutrition and provide baseline information for nutritional assessments in the future. Some of your patients that will require a thorough nutritional assessment include those patients with Recent unintentional weight loss Chemotherapy or radiation Recent weight gain Food allergies or intolerance Decreased appetite Multiple medications Alterations in sense of taste Dieting history Difficulty chewing or swallowing Wanting Mobility problems Diarrhea Inability to feed self Recent surgery or major illness or injury Substance abuse Chronic conditions Potential for social isolation Low income To the physical examination when performing a focused assessment, nurse will use at least one of the following four basic techniques during your physical exam. Inspection. Auscultation. Percussion. Palpation. These techniques should be used in an organized manner from least disturbing or invasive to most invasive to the patient. Inspection is first, as it is non-invasive. Auscultation is performed following inspection. The abdomen should be auscultated before percussion or palpation to prevent production of false bubble sounds. For accurate assessment of the abdomen, patient relaxation is essential. The patient should be comfortable with knees supported and arms at the sides, and should have an empty bladder. The environment should include a comfortable temperature, with good light. The physical exam, inspection. Visualization of the entire abdomen is needed. When assessing the abdomen, it is important to document the location of the physical exam finding. The abdomen can be divided into four or nine quadrants. Inspection with the patient in the supine position, inspect for bulges, mucous membrane, ulcers, tongue, gums and teeth, salivary glands, oral passageway, masses, hernias, Ascites, spider navy, enlarged veins, pulsations or movements, inability to lie flat, the physical exam, auscultation, auscultation should begin in the right lower quadrant. If bubble sounds are not heard, in order to determine if bubble sounds are truly absent, listen for a total of 5 minutes. Bubble sounds echo the underlying movements of the intestines. It is normal to hear high-pitched clicking and gurgling sounds approximately every 5 to 15 seconds. It is suggested that you listen to bubble sounds for a full minute before determining if they are normal, hypoactive, or hyperactive. 
refer to the table to see how different vowel sounds are produced and what they may indicate. The physical exam, percussion. Percussion is used to elicit tenderness or sounds that give clues to underlying problems. When percussing directly over suspected areas of tenderness, monitor the patient for signs of discomfort. When examining the abdomen, percuss for general tympani, liver span, and splenic dullness. Tympani should be the predominant sound when percussing the abdomen. A. Floats. To the top of the abdomen in the supine position and tympani reflects a drum-like sound. Dullness is usually heard over solid organs or masses such as the liver, spleen, or a full bladder. Percussion Percussing over the kidneys does not usually produce pain or discomfort. If tenderness is present, a urinary tract infection or kidney inflammation may be present. To determine if abdominal distension is due to fluid or air, nurse may want to ask a nursing assistant or another nurse to assist her in percussing a fluid wave. If a fluid wave is present, as with the sights, nurse will feel the resulting wave with her opposite hand. If the distension is due to air nurse will not feel any wave. Air floats to the top of the abdomen in the supine position and tympani reflects a drum-like sound. The physical exam, palpation. Palpation is another commonly used physical exam technique that requires nurse to touch patient with different parts of her hand using different strength pressures. During light palpation, nurse press the skin about a half inch to three quarters inch with the pads of her fingers. When using deep palpation, use finger pads and compress the skin about one half to two inches. Palpate lightly then deeply noting any muscle guarding, rigidity, masses or tenderness. Palpate tender areas last. Only if indicated, palpate the liver margins, the spleen or the kidneys and percuss the abdomen for general tympani, liver span, splenic dullness, costovertebral angle tenderness, presence of fluid wave, or shifting dullness with the sights. Palpation allows nurse to assess for texture, tenderness, temperature, moisture, pulsations, masses, and internal organs. Normally, nurse should elicit no tenderness on either light or deep palpation of the abdomen. If inguinal lymph nodes are palpated, they should be small and freely movable. So guys, thanks for watching my video. You can like and comment on my video, but don't forget to subscribe my YouTube channel to watch quality content like this. Thank you guys.